Good afternoon, everybody. Last talk of the day. Hopefully, the waiting was worth it. First, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mike Müller, and I've been using Python more than 16 years now. And I make my living teaching Python, so I'm from Python Academy, and I teach Python courses. But this time, I would like to talk about a little bit different topic, about functional Python, this Python is Mochi. So Mochi is a language that's actually written in Python itself and works closely together with Python and has some very interesting, uh, I think, very interesting functional features. Okay. Mochi is dynamically typed just like Python and it supports functional programming and also supports some kind of actor style programming. I'm not really going to talk about this one today. And it needs Python 3, 3.2 actually, because it also, also works with PyPy. So PyPy, the, new, the, the re newest release of PyPy in the 3 series is 3.2. Otherwise, of course, it works with Python 3.4. And actually, Mochi translates to Python 3 AST, so abstract syntax tree. So there have been a few talks talking about this one. And then, of course, it, once you are there, abstract syntax tree, you can translate to bytecode. And the new feature, which I recently added myself, actually, you can translate it, translate it to Python 3 code. So really, Python code, you can see it. It's not fully functional yet. There's a few things missing, but uh, the, the examples are translated that work. OK. And this makes up a nice uh, some features, so the features of the language. So the syntax is very Python-like, so indentation matters, for instance. And then there are a few features that are interesting for for functional programming in general. Tail call elimination, so you, you don't have the recursion limit you would have in Python, which is interesting. Of course, you don't have loops. You don't have any loops you, you, you're used to in Python. There will be different kind of programming. You cannot reassign, you cannot reassign uh, in, inside a function. You use persistent data types, and these persistent data types just use pyrsystent, which is a different Python library you might know. So uh, Mochi uses quite a few Python libraries. So you try to implement as little as possible uh, itself, but use other libraries. Some, something I want to show you, show you is pattern matching. So you might be, maybe you're familiar with kind of Haskell style pattern matching. So there's a few things that come from Haskell. And there are, there are data types like algebraic data types. Uh, I'm not talking about this topic too much here. And then there's a pipeline operator. I'm going to show you the pipeline operator. And there are some so interesting things for anonymous functions. So the lambda function, Python is a little bit different here. There's this actor style thing like Erlang. You can write macros, like a list. And you have a few built-ins that come from, uh, from, from Python, like iter tools and func tools and others operator there, built-ins. And of course, you have an interactive prompt, the REPL, so it's like the Python interactive prompt. And it works with IPython Notebook, that there's some basic implementation you can run it in IPython Notebook, which is pretty nice because I spend most of my time and I do something in IPython Notebooks. Okay, now I want to show you some of those features uh, in a little bit more detail and show actually some code. Okay, you have the REPL. So once you have Mochi installed, Mochi is just, you can say pip install it. So if you have, of course you need Python 3. If you have Python 3, let's say Python 3.4, you can pip install it, installs with pip with a bunch of dependencies. And then at the command line, you just type mochi, you see in the well-known interactive prompt. And then you can do something, you can solve very difficult mathematical problems like one plus one, and you get two as an answer. So it looks very much like Python. And you can define a function that looks very much like Python. And you see the only difference here, there's no return. So the last expression in a function is actually what will be returned. And what I do here, and see when I define it, I always get back the function object itself, and then I call the function, and you get the seven, which is three plus four. And you type exit, you out. So the, so the interactive prompt is very similar to, to Python. Interactive prompt. You can also write scripts. When you write a script, when you write a module, so I, you, I write a file which is called add mochi here. And I just to put my function inside the file, and then I can import it. So in the, in the interactive prompt, I just import it, and I can call it. So very similar to Python. So not so much difference, which is nice. You don't want to learn too many things new. Just reuse whatever you, you can, and this is very similar how Python works. You can generate Python bytecode on the command line if you like. So that's what I do for tests, for instance. So I use uh, 
py.test to run the tests. And this is just generating actually Python, Python bytecode, and then run uses everything you can use with py.test or pytest to run the test. So you don't have to develop your own testing machinery. Just use whatever is there with pytest. So um, then once I, you compile it, just the command line, so the PYC option compiles the bytecode and also output file, and it compiles to the same name output file, and you can import it as pure Python bytecode, and you can import it and you can work with it from Python. As I said, you can also generate Python source code. So it looks a bit more messy here. So that's the source code <coughs> that comes out. Of course, it in inputs quite a few boilerplate things you actually don't need in this case for this special case. <coughs> that's in, in no way optimized and it also adds a few unnecessary nuns and stuff in here and puts an add there. But in general, it generates Python code. And I tried it with different things and sometimes it generates quite a bit of Python code. Uh, and some of things are not actually needed, which would be maybe if you run some optimizer which just get rid of stuff that's not needed. But a general works, it just can produce Python code, which is nice because then you're back in the Python world and you can use all the Python tools if you like. Okay, you can also use Python modules in Mochi. So if you just import NumPy, which is a very commonly used module in the scientific Python world for numerical arrays, multi-dimensional arrays. And uh, you see what I'm doing here. This, every, everything I do, did here is, is done in, in this notebook. I, I use the notebook to make the slides, and this is a notebook in Mochi mode. So you can, all the slides are always made in Mochi, if you want to say. Actually, they are made inside Python notebook, of course. But the, the cells here are Mochi cells. And then you see if, if I say import NumPy, and I can define this A NumPy, and this always returns it here. This, this, is a, this is a representation of the array, which is A range, just like a range. And then I multiply A times two, you get element-wise multiplication, and you get a result multiplied by two. So you can reuse everything you have uh, from Python. All the extensions should work, because it's just in the end, everything's just Python, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, so you can use also, if you want to write a Flask app, you can write a Flask app and just works with the Flask app. So there are some examples, an example repository, and then one of them is using writing a Flask app, if you like. Okay. So the first thing, this, this, uh, this re recursive calls, so you, this, is, this is the example uh, recursive function, so it's vectorial. So if I get n and m, if n is one, I return m, otherwise I, c I call myself. And this is a factorial. And typically, if you would do this in Python, then if you have more than 1,000 recursions, you get an exceptions, and you, you could increase the recursion limit if you like. But here you don't. And actually, if you want to, you can look at the Python code it generates. So it's pretty interesting. It's just a while loop, actually, in the background. And of course, translating it to a loop, which is an interesting concept. And here, uh, if you look at the timing, it, it's not totally very fast. Uh, typically, so speed is not, is, hasn't been a concern yet, so there's no optimization, but the app was just a concern that make, make it work in the first place. And then if you look at it, you see that that's a very long number. I didn't print the numbers a bit long, so just convert it to a string and print the length, so it's 35,000 digits of the number, so you don't want to see this number, so it's not going to be interesting. Okay, you can do this, just this is kind of a Python style function, but now if you want to be a bit more functional, you can do pattern matching, exactly the same function, but now written with pattern matching. So pattern matching is similar to Haskell style pattern matching. So this is a pattern I match. So if, if I get an n, then I recall the factorial with n and one. Otherwise, I, if I get a zero, I just return this zero in this accumulator here, I return the accumulator. Otherwise, if I get n and the accumulator, I just call it factorial with n. This is exactly the same thing as we had before, but written in a different style. This is, this is pattern matching. So if you know of Haskell, that looks, looks familiar somehow. And you could write something like this. Once you get used to this style, that might be more readable than the other one. It takes a while, because it's a new concept. If you have never seen this, of course, it's a new concept. But now you have this pattern matching, you can write pattern matching. And the source code that is, that is generated is a bit different, and you see the runtime is a bit slower. You see, the runtime before was 0.04 seconds, and this is uh, 0.1 five seconds, about nearly four times slower. So it's not optimized yet. And if you look at the Python source code, it generates, it generates a bunch of intermediate variables and stuff like this. So this can certainly be optimized and maybe make it faster as the other one. But this would be something, so if you, if you, if you like this, play a little bit with Haskell or something like this, then, then you can use the same pattern here and at the end, you end up with Python and you can use the rest of the Python world. So this is pattern matching. So if you have a list, with the numbers one to three, 
And then you see th that's, that's actually, all of them is done in notebook. That's a notebook cell and then it spits out this down here. You see I will treat this in a minute P vector. It's a pi assistant data structure, a pers persistent vector, just the list that you can mutate, so to speak. So if you have my list and then I, I match the pattern, you see, and I have this, if this list here, this is an X, this will turn the X. Because I match this one and X can be anything. So there has to be a one and a two and anything. So it returns my X. Everything else will return none. This is a typical pattern matching thing. There are some rules to it. There's no real, if you look at this, there's no real documentation how the pattern matching works. So we, that's something we want to do, write some documentation that is actually kind of useful. So it works, but you have to document how it works. The same thing here, you see you have this add operator, uh, this ampersand here, it's very similar to the Python star. So it's matching all the rest. So if it's a one, then no matter how many other elements you want, and then you want the rest, and you see it gives you back down here the two and three. So you have this, this different style of matching. Just as an example, you can do this matching here, and then you have this match, you get something back. Okay. More pattern matching, for instance, you can match something like this, a fifth bus function, depending on the arguments you get for n, the argument for n, I do something different. So if, if, if n is evenly divisible by, by three, and five, I get fifth bus, it's only, the, it's only by three, I get fifth, and, if, and only the five, by five, it get bus. And then if in many runs, as you see, if I use the, uh, this different, if you use a one, it's not evenly divisible. I get the one back because that's, that's this case down here, the, the last case, yeah. And the other cases you see is three, five, you get the corresponding one and 15 is divisible by three and five, you get the last one. So that's how this pattern matching works and you can do something like this. That's pretty interesting. So no loops. So again, I, you can use pattern matching. This is just sum. So of course in Python it's easier. You used to build in function sum. That's a toy example. But let's see how it works. And it's typical for functional programming. So you have the head and the tail, which I call it here. So you can call something else, but it makes sense. So this is the first, and this is all the rest. And you just say, if you have this one, then you just take the head plus the sum. So recursive called itself to the tail. And if it's empty, it just return zero. Yeah. So this is the same thing as a sum function recursively. So it's a, you, you force, if, if you like loops, you can still write loops in, in the Python module, import it and calculate the sum, but this is, uh, since the loop doesn't have any side effects here, then that's a, the function style to do it. Okay, no loops. Uh, you have a pipeline operator. So I reuse, you, you reuse the same function uh, I used before, this, this, uh, this FISBUS function, you see, and now I can put this, this is, this is a pipeline operator. The pipe and the greater sign. So um, I can generate a range, which is, a, which is a, everything's lazy. It's like in Python 3, range, yeah? So it's a range object from, from one to 30. And then I move this range up to the map, and I map this FISBUS function on this range object. So the, this FISBUS function is called 30 times for each number. And then this, this is still lazy. And then I move it to the P vector to, to make it into a list, so to speak, and this persistent list. And then I move it to print to print it out. And the result is, this, this is the first line, this is the artifact of the definition, and then this is a result. This is this P vector with its, its 30 numbers where I apply the functions to everything, yep, on it by three, by five, and three and five, then it's the same function. You get the results. So this is a pipeline operator, which is pretty interesting. So it's chosen this. Operator could be something else, but uh, this is unique. It's not used for anything else. So, also in Python, I don't, I don't think the operator exists in Python itself. So, it makes it unique as a pipeline operator. So, you use persistent data structures. So, this would be a talk in itself. If you know PyAssistant, which is a Python library, which is used, which uh, Moji uses here. So, everything is immutable. And when you do something like an append, so I make a I make a list here. See, you always see the return down here. I make a list v, which is a p vector, or make a, mut a, a mapping. It looks like a dictionary. And then, if I, I say append, it doesn't actually mutate. It gives me back a new object v2 in this case, which has it before appended and the, the V itself stays as it was before. Yeah, and there's more of them, quite a, 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 quite a more of them. It's their own library uh, that's, that we use here, so all the data structures should be uh, persistent, which is a feature of uh, function programming. You can write anonymous functions, so lambda, so this would be one bit. This is the add function that adds X plus Y. 
So X and Y the arguments. And then we just use this arrow kind of symbol instead of lambda to return X and Y. The sum of X and Y, and if you call it, you get a string back. That's, you can write it like this, or this would be exactly the same thing. You say, I define a new function add, and then use the same symbol, and then use a dollar sign. This argument one and argument two. So you don't have to even name them, and then you just get back, and I call it this, the, the sum of the one and two is three. So that's one way of writing anonymous functions, which can be handy. Once you get used to it, that this dollar sign has its meaning. So you can do something like this. And so, for instance, you could do something like this. I map, and I define a function here that says, takes the first argument and multiply it by two, and map it to the one, two, three. That's just, just, it's like list comprehension, x times two for x in list, pretty much, in this case. But you could do something else, and this would be a p vector, so a persistent vector. If you don't do the p vector, just get a map object, you wouldn't see anything, because it's lazy. But that's how you can write anonymous functions here. So, it also, as I said, uh, it runs in an IPython notebook. There's still quite a bit of room to improve, so there's a basic uh, kernel, actually implemented by Matthias Bozones, I think is his name. He's a IPython core developer, and I just inherited the project. It has some basic functionalities. It, there's still a few things missing. There are no call tips, no magic functions, and there's also some kind of problem and that standard error goes to the consoles instead of the notebook, so you have to resolve this one. But in general, you just type in a cell and you get back the result, which is nice to play, play around with it. So it has a notebook mode, and you can use it. And we just also have a few minutes for questions. And the status right now. This is it's still a very early uh, project. It, it's work. It has a working implementation, as I'll show you. It works and, and does pretty much what the, what the features say, but it's still pretty early phase. So it needs more tests. So I wrote a few tests. Um, it actually uses PyTest, which is nice. So you can use all the PyTest machinery to automate the test, have a few tests. You need more tests. It doesn't cover everything. Uh, it needs more documentation. So right now, there's not much documentation. There's just a readme file, which pretty much shows what I have here, a few more things in there in the readme, but there's no real documentation, of course, and there's nobody really using it yet, but might be interesting to, if you want to get in functional programming. So it's a, it's a new language to some degree, but still uses so much of Python that you can use all the Python ecosystem and you don't have to invent anything uh, new. Good, so it's a, I made a short, very short work, I think. So I'm, I'm planning to have a sprint here at your Python if you're interested, so I put it up on this wiki page, so if you want to sprint, and if you're interested in function programming in general, there might be an idea just to sit together and do something. So since it's very early, you still can form the project. Uh, we had a sprint at PyCon US, and there's a few people that had some ideas what to do, to write some more formal things, the formal language uh, um, things, and have some more testing, and, and so there's something going on there. But if you're interested in functional programming, it would be nice to sit together and look at this source code and do something with it. And I would like to thank you, thank uh, the lead developer. So I, I'm, I'm not the developer of, the, of this thing, I just got into the project later on. It's developed by a, a Japanese guy used, uh, called Yasushi Ito, and he's in Japan, obviously, and probably he will take part in the sprint remotely. He's always like eight or nine hours or 10 hours difference or something like this. Uh, but he's the one who came up with the idea and I find it pretty interesting. And there are a few other people that like it to contribute a little bit to the to the source code. And maybe it could be a way to integrate it somehow in the Python ecosystem to have some functional approach to certain type of type of tasks without leaving what you have invested in Python already. Okay, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions and if you want to reach me, that's my email address and also there will be something up at the, at the sprint page. So if you're interested here, stay over the weekend to come to the sprint and talk a bit more about it. Thank you very much. So where do you see the project in, let's say, three years? Excuse me? I was just wondering, is it more, let's say, a hobby, um, an education project, or wh where would you see it if it was totally successful in three years? 
would it be part of Python language, so maybe the pattern matching would move there? Or? That's, a, that's a good question, I don't know yet. So right now it's just a, just a very interesting project. It's, I don't have a real use case for that. I need it for something also. It's just, it's more like an interesting hobby project to do something just because I'm playing this functional program for a while. Um, but I like Python also, and that would be maybe a good interesting approach to see if it works, to have some functional stuff sitting on top of Python. That, that's what I like. Because if you use Haskell, it's a different language, totally different ecosystem, and you have to do totally different things. Here you can reuse a lot of your Python knowledge, but you have a few more interesting ideas that might be useful for certain type of problems. But you don't have to decide, I want to do only Python or only Haskell or something. It's very easy to go from one to the other. That's what I think. Right now it's just for interest, but maybe some, somebody has, some people really like, some, some people that come from function programming, come to Python, they miss a few things. That might be inter interesting this way. So that's, that's, a, that's just the state of the project. Okay, thank you. <coughs> How much work um, is it to be able to make everybody have um, pattern matching in Python based on your work? If, if I want to backport what you have done on pattern matching, for instance, uh, in Python, how much work is it? I, I don't know if I can understand your question. If you, you want to put the pattern ah. matching into Python on how much work it would be, is this a question? Yes. I, I don't know how much work it would be. This is a, this is a totally different path. So you, you pass the source code and generate Python. That's a very different thing. So you sit on top and you generate Python and then instead of writing all this Python by hand, you just generate it from a much more convenient source code. But in, in the end, it's just Python. If it's AST or bytecode or Python, um, uh, code is, is the same. I, I don't think you, uh, there will be any chance to get pattern matching into Python before Python 4 or Python 4, but I don't know. <laughs> no. No. In the last few years, there were uh, several uh, uh, functional programming languages, new uh, languages like Scala, Clojure, F Sharp, uh, and how, how do you see uh, Moki or Moki uh, um, among them, also OCaml, uh, where it will be, you, you think, uh, uh, in comparison with uh, all those that most of them are based on the Java uh, uh, platform? Yeah, so F-sharp F is in .NET, but the other ones are, are Java-based. Yeah, so th that seems like it's a, it's a common thing. You have this Java language, which can solve a certain problem, and on top of it, we have Clojure, which works with the JVM. And this is to some degree s similar. So, of course, Roger is very new, and that doesn't have the many features yet, but it sits on top of Python, and you, you might use it for solve some different types of problems that Python might not be the best, or you don't like it, or s something like this. So that's, that's how I see it right now. So um, it's very difficult to predict the, the future. So, but it's, it's similar to this. And Clojure is used quite a bit in Scala. They are pretty successful. Hi. Um, are there doc strings in Mochi? Uh, I don't know. I, I think so. I haven't ch checked. I, there should be. So. I think there should be in there. Otherwise we, otherwise, we put it in. So if something is missing, put it in. But, it shouldn't be difficult. but I think it's, it's, there should be there. OK. Um, yeah, thank you for the really interesting talk. It's, uh, like it's the first project I see where people compile something ah, yeah. into Python bytecode. And uh, so kind of thank you for opening the floodgates of like having a bunch of languages on the same platform, which I think could be useful and because many people are missing different features and now they don't need to go to Guido, but they can just roll their own. <laughs> uh, and I have a small question. Uh, so in the example with the pipeline, it seems like you partially apply in map. And I was wondering how do you figure out uh, whether you partially apply function or not, because in Python, like, it would not be very clear. Uh, like the number of arguments can be varying. And so how do you, uh, do you know how this is, how this works? Because, uh, this is normal Python map in the end, right? Yeah, so you, have, you, have, you have one argument, you have n, and you apply the function fizzbus to all this, to, to everything in, in the list. 
Yeah, so basically... It iterates, it iterates through the list. It's just one argument for every... It's just, it's just like a list comprehension. Yeah, but what, what stands between the second pipeline and the, and, uh, the first and second pipeline, it, it, it looks to me like partial application of map. Uh, and then it would be applied to something that goes through the pipeline. So I was wondering how it figures out that here it needs to partially apply it, whereas in some other places it... Yeah, so you see, like, it's like it takes map as a first argument and then gets, with a, with a pipeline operator, gets all the other arguments in there. It's like map, map will apply to a list. In this case, means apply map to this list of, uh, uh, apply map to range map. Yeah, I, I understand how yeah. this works. Uh, I, I just, uh, what I don't understand is how the parser understands that in this case, map should be partially applied. But if, if for example, I wrote print this buzz in the middle, uh, it would, probably need to, like, you would need to fully apply print, perhaps, or something like that. Or maybe also, uh, so I was wondering uh, how this works in practice. Maybe I'll come to you. I, I, I don't know in detail. We have, to, we have to look at the source code, how it works, so I don't know. Hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, what was the inspiration for the name of the language? Uh, the, the name is, is Japanese, means rice cake. So this is, uh, uh, Yasushi yeah, 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 decided for the name. So the name was given already. Thanks. I've got two, two questions. The, the first, so you've got all these persistent data structures which are really wonderful in other languages that have great multi-threading, but in this case, it seems like a lot of that power is just lost. Is there, are there plans to somehow magically support more threading around these persistent data structures? It runs with PyPy. So if, oh, okay. if, if, if you saw the talk before, the STM works, and PyPy is doing the right thing, PyPy should probably figure this out itself. I'm not sure. So that, that's one thing. So it's, it's just Python bytecode. It works with PyPy. That's why we say we need Python 3.2 because PyPy right now is in mo most modern versions of 3.2. That would be probably the easiest solution. Just do whatever there because doing it yourself could be a lot of work. Right. And, and the second question was about the actor stuff. How, when you have these actors running, what are they running in separate threads, different processes? Is async they, they use, they use uh, um, event let, I think. Okay. Yeah, so there's, they're, they use eventlet, and I, have, I haven't worked with the, with the actors yet, so I, have, I cannot tell you much about the actors, but they use eventlet to just give you a nicer syntax to use it. More questions? Um, which technique do you use to optimize the recursion? It's not optimized, it's just rewritten in a loop. So if you, if you look at the source code, uh, you, can, you can translate it. Uh, there's, a, there's a translator and you can look at the source code. It's just a while, okay. while true loop and just translating it to a loop. So Generate the intermediate function, stuff like this. When you have mutual recursivity, you transform, let's say, three or two functions in a big loop? Or do you just handle uh, recursion with one function? It's just one function so far. Okay. More questions? So thank you very much. Thank you.